webinar series, um, Health Partnerships Perspectives. I am Hal Ali, the coordinator of Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnerships and Easter Island. The webinars of this series will take place on the last Friday of every second month at 12 p.m. GMT. We will invite speakers and experts from healthcare and global health fields to discuss various aspects of institutional health partnerships. This webinar is the first in the series, and today's topic is evaluating institutional health partnerships. We will be recording the first hour of this webinar. For those who are interested, there will be an informal questions and answers session for practical questions specifically about the EFFECT tool, which will not be recorded. The recording of this webinar will be available in our website, www.ester.eu, and our YouTube channel, Esther Alliance. Live streaming is also available right now on our YouTube channel. So today we will have three presentations, and then we will have a discussion and the question and answer session. If you have any questions during the webinar, please send them to the questions and answer feature in the bottom of the screen or the chat box, and we will address your questions later. For now, I will leave you with my co-host and the moderator of this webinar, Dorte Bittit, the head of Easter Switzerland. Hi, Dorte. Thank you very much, Hala. Welcome everybody to today's webinar on evaluating institutional health partnerships. Um, I think we've all seen during the pandemic that um, part health partnerships are becoming even more important. And at the same time, it's important that partnerships are truly equal and allowing for mutual learning. And so it's important to, um, to not only evaluate the implementation of a specific project, but to um, also look at the quality of the partnership itself. So in this webinar, we are inviting speakers to discuss the following questions. Why should we evaluate institutional partnerships? How can we make the most out of the results from such evaluations? and lessons learned from the partnerships evaluation processes. So we will start by a general introduction to the evaluation of institutional health partnerships. And, and then we will hear two presentations about the practical experience with the um, effect tool that the ESSER Alliance is using. So I would like to, to hand over to, um, to Vicky Doyle, who is the Director of Capacity Development International Vicky, together with um, Emma Kelly, um, developed the EFFECT tool based on a vast literature review, and I look forward to hearing her presentation. Over to you, Vicky. Okay, thank you very much, Dorta. Okay, and let me just get that on to share. Can we see that okay? Great. Okay, so um, as Dorta said, I'm going to try and talk you through some of our thinking about why evaluate institutional health partnerships. Um, this work was done by myself and Emma Kelly, who was also in, in the webinar today, and was based on, I think, huge amounts of conversations with many of the um, members of the ESTA Alliance, with SET and other key players in global health. Mm -hmm. Um, and just, you know, we've been thinking about and IHPs for a very long time. Um, in fact, since 2012, when we did our first evaluation of the International Health Links Funding Scheme, which was the precursor to the Health Partnership Scheme of FET. Um, so it is something that we have been, you know, strategizing over and trying to think about, well, what is this model of working and where does it fit within the development cooperation landscape. So some of our reflections really from sort of this experience of evaluating programs and working with different partners were, are institutional health partnerships doing the right things? You know, what types, what, why are some IHPs more successful than others? Um, how can or do IHPs embed change into the institutions that they're working in and the wider health system? How do they contribute to health system strengthening? What is that additionality of partnership working? I think when we spoke to a lot of partnerships, they talked about something beyond the project. So what is it? What is that additionality, both at an individual level and an institutional level? And I think very importantly about how can we go beyond 
the kind of reporting or the counting of activities and outputs? How do we go beyond that? And so I think so, what we really wanted to do was also challenge IHPs to think about impact, their reach, the lasting benefits, sustainability, and to think about the evaluation of it, not at the end, but at the start, when these partnerships were first forming, when projects were being developed. Um, I think it's fair to say, and I think many of us will also agree with me, that um, you know, we, I've seen countless projects in development cooperation, successful projects. When a project is well-funded, well-resourced, it's relatively easy to have success. You know, but projects have a short term nature. And when that funding goes so often to does the capacity and the sustainability to continue what that work was doing. Whereas partnerships, real partnerships, these are long term commitments and they take time. They take time, it takes time for trust to develop and to get true collaboration. So what we wanted to do was looking more looking beyond the quick wins and the short-term evidence and to really sort of help the whole IHP movement to distinguish between those partners partnerships can really which can really bring about change so the way we see it when we're looking at evaluating partnerships there are different domains that we should look at there's the effectiveness of the partnership intervention the project and this is where we would argue that you use those routine project m &E tools, the dreaded log frame, the theory of change or whatever other methods that you're using. And that's looking at the specific intervention, whether it's maternal newborn child health project, an HIV project, a diabetes intervention. Then we can look at the quality of the partnership itself. And this may be looking at the ESTA quality of partnership. It could be looking at, there are, very, there are various tools which have been developed to look at the quality of partnership. But I think when we were discussing, particularly in our discussions with Esther, the Alliance, it was like, how do we capture the lasting benefits of this partnership approach? And this is where we felt there was real, there really was a gap. And we felt that many partnerships were doing great work, but the routine M&E didn't really pick up on what it was that they were doing. And so this is where we were sort of asked to look at, well, is there a tool we could develop to do this? And so in terms of the relationship with M&E, what we would argue is that using the Esther effect tool, this is something which would be complementary, not instead of the routine project m and &E. And I think that's very, very important. The kind of indicators, these are neutral. So we call them content neutral in terms of the specific technical intervention. So whether it's a diabetes prevention program, whether it's a maternal newborn health program, it doesn't matter. The indicators are content neutral from the specific technical intervention you're looking at. The aim is to measure best practice. That's in relation to the implementation, capacity strengthening and embedding change. So it can be used for any intervention seeking to build capacity through partnership. So why develop yet another measurement tool? Because I do think we have to be very, very serious here. And I, I will often argue we mustn't measure for measurement's sake. We only want to measure if we're gonna use it. But I think what we felt was there wasn't a tool that was measuring the effectiveness and added value of the partnership approach. So it was needed to help partnerships assess their current practice, how they went about trying to embed change, how they designed that into the program and following it through. It was about learning as well, because one of the things we noted, particularly in some partnerships, people didn't always have that development assistance experience. They hadn't done some of these things before. So it was about building individual and institutional capacity to work towards best practice. And I think very importantly about actually capturing evidence, you know, of whether this partnership approach does have lasting benefit, which was, I think, particularly of interest both to institutional partnerships, but also to the funders, because I think in the early days, there was quite a lot of cynicism about this approach. So that was when the Esther Effect tool was born, which was countless nights, weeks, months of myself and Emma pouring over the literature and thinking about what this tool would, be, would look like and how it could be useful and practically used. We didn't want it to be yet another tool which people completed because they had to and that was it. It was something that was going to be of use to the partnerships and to the programme managers who were running those partnerships. 
It was evidence informed. So we did spend a lot of time looking at both the gray and published literature. We looked at a whole variety of frameworks and indicators, looking at implementation best practice, institutional strengthening, health system strengthening. And we piloted this tool for applicability, feasibility and ease of use in amongst several partnerships to really see how robust was it? Would it was it going to be useful? Did people actually find this useful? I think the other thing that one of the models which really informed our thinking as well was the health system strengthening cube. And I, I like to bring this up because what we often see in many projects is they're very good at providing inputs, very good at providing the support elements. So you, a short term project can provide physical infrastructure, it can do some training, it can provide some technology, it can provide some equipment, it can provide some funding and managers. But if you really want to bring about change, it's moving from support to strengthening. It's about going to those deeper look at those performance drivers of change. And that's what we wanted to do with this tool was to get people to think about, well, where are we now and where do we have to get to? So, so the tool is modular. There are indicators which have statements showing different stages of development. And some of these are of the indicators we would expect partnerships to start with and then progress to higher stages. And some of these indicators show a move from that supporting role to strengthening role, to working towards best practice. And I think this allows partners therefore to benchmark against each other, to see changes over time, to quantify them, but I think most importantly to open a dialogue and to discuss, well, what does this mean? And what action as a result of this do we need to take? Because often the different partners may have different views about where they are at and where the progress is. And I think the, the following two um, presentations will talk through this. So these are the sections of the tool. Um, I'm gonna keep skipping through this because I'm hoping that you would have seen this tool, but it's looking at implementation best practice, embedding change, whether you're looking at curriculum, learning and teaching, capacity building activities, um, whole institutional strengthening. And I think the important thing to mention is you may not be doing all of these things and, it's, and the tool is flexible. You don't have to fill in every single section if it's not applicable. And so although the tool may have looked quite long for some people, I think the main thing is to use it in a flexible way and adapt it to the partnership that you're, or the project within which you're working. So that was the example showing that you'd be wanting to work towards best practice so that going from the left to the right in terms of where you were at the start and how you progressed. And these were the themes. And again, yeah, this was based on an extensive review of the literature looking at sort of the range of capacity development um, methods being used, looking at the motivation for change. It was, and these were all indicators drawn from the literature. Just one piece of, I just love this quote. This was from as a senior um, partner in one of the Northern Partnership Institutes. And he said, I was really motivated to complete the tool as I was learning from it. I'm not a global health expert, but a clinician who works in global health. I really began to start understanding how I might measure things. The rubrics were really educational when completing it. So in terms of how this works, um, what we would really suggest is that you know, this, the tool is, it contributes to dialogue and decision-making. So the individuals from the different partners complete the Esther Effect tool, which could take anything from 20 minutes, maybe up to 60 minutes. These results then get compiled. One more minute, Vicky. Yeah, they get prioritized, but then the important thing is the discussion where you get the insights from the different partners and then the discussion about the actions and then the agreed actions. And that's the important thing is about how you use the results of this tool to bring about learning and to bring about actions. So I think this is so in summary, why use the Esther Effect tool? It's about improving the effectiveness of how health partnerships implement and embed their project initiatives for sustained change and to capture that added value. They can be applicable to all types of health partnerships. It's a self-assessment tool. It supplements routine project monitoring and evaluation. It, 
uh, said it doesn't specifically focus on the quality of partnership, but does look at some of those aspects. We would say when to use it, it should be used for each project initiative being implemented within a health partnership, and it should be used on a routine basis from the start until the end and even post project, depending on the duration of the funding. So key messages. It's an evidence-based tool. Those indicators, there is very much content neutral, so any type of partnership can use it. It's looking at these different elements of um, implementation best practice, embedding change, and those individual and institutional benefits, complementary to routine m &E, and it's part of a process of discussion and decision-making. So I very much hope that the colleagues now will talk about the practical application of this. How did this work in practice? So thank you. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, I suggest that we be, um, move on straight to the next presentation and we will take um, questions and answers um, after all three presentations. However, feel free to post your questions in, in the chat box for the question um, section. I would like to hand over to uh, <clears throat> Sorry, to Ahmed Razavi, who is a consultant in global public health, and he has experience, um, he has practical experience with the EFFECT tool, um, using it in a partnership between Public Health England and Nigeria CDC. Ahmed, over to you. Thanks very much, Dota. Um, my name is uh, Ahmed Razavi. Uh, as as Dota explained, I am the uh, Africa Portfolio Lead for the IHR Strengthening Project, um, which is a UK aid funded project through the Department of Health and Social Care, um, which works on increasing international health regulations compliance uh, across uh, a number of different countries, uh, which I'll get into in a moment. As Vicky outlined, uh, she's given sort of the theory and the basis of around the tool, and we've practically delivered the tool in one of our contexts, which is between ourselves and Nigeria CDC. Uh, and I'll be talking briefly about um, that uh, delivery of the tool. Uh, next slide, please. Just to give you a quick overview of our project. Um, so we have a triple mandate of strengthening leadership, building technical capability and developing sustainable public health systems. And we work in partnership with National Public Health Institute. So that partnership working bit, the institutional health partnerships and the strength of that is vital to the success of our project and ensuring that there is a sustainable way of us moving forward with our, our triple mandate. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and this is just a quick map of the various different uh, partners that we work with. So we have both country and regional work streams. Uh, the one that we're going to focus on today is with Nigeria CDC in, in Nigeria. Next slide, please. And this slide demonstrates exactly why the Esther Effect tool is needed. If, if I can draw your attention to the bottom right corner, the feedback from the Director General of Nigeria CDC is, is fantastic and very welcome, but actually that strength of partnership is only really measured at the moment in, in, in a lot of ways just through qualitative means. Um, and we can certainly showcase quotes such as that, but actually measuring the value of the partnership um, is, is quite difficult to do and Esther Effect remains one of the only tools that actually looks into this and looks into the quality of the partnership, which as I'll come on to later on in my presentation, is really vital to ensuring that any sort of aid or development work is successful uh, in its implementation. Next slide, please. And this is our, our publication that we've written up about this. I encourage everyone uh, who is interested in this to have a read of the publication. It goes into a lot more detail about the results themselves. Uh, what I'll do today is give you a bit of background, uh, a bit about the process and some benefits and challenges. But if you want some more detailed look at the results, um, then please do have a look at this paper. Next slide, please. Thank you. So our relationship with Nigeria CDC goes back to 2017. We signed a memorandum of understanding with them back in November 2017, uh, and this tool was delivered in May 2019. So still really in the infancy of the partnership, but we did want to find out what the perceived engagement in and benefits from the partnership were, both for Public Health England and for Nigeria CDC, what the delivery of learning was like, the reach and delivery of cap capacity building activities, and how the partnership could be improved moving forward. And that last bit is really where I feel Esther, the Esther Effect tool showcased its strength. Next slide, please. 
So this is the process we went through. As, as Vicky's already outlined, it's quite a flexible approach. Um, so people are, I'm sure Vicky would agree that people are free to uh, deliver it in, in whatever way suits their particular context. For us, it meant that we delivered it in this way. So we started off with preparatory work. We ensured that all the high level stakeholders were bought into the process and engaged with it because without that, quite frankly, uh, the tool wouldn't be able to be delivered properly. And we wanted to outline the aims and objectives of the tool clearly at the outset, because this is quite a new thing. So there were a lot of questions, both from a Nigeria CDC perspective and from a PhD perspective with regards to uh, what exactly are we trying to achieve here. Following that, we had two three hour sessions in country where all of the partners sat around the table. And of course, given the current COVID-19 uh, context, this is probably not going to be particularly possible right now. Um, but it was really invaluable to have all of these senior leadership team members sitting across the table from one, each, one another and learning uh, about the tool and us being able to facilitate that discussion between them. Session one involved introducing everyone to the tool and running through the process itself, and then all participants filled in the questionnaires. Session two was conducted by some external consultants to ensure that there was impartiality. It wasn't skewed towards a PHE or a Nigeria CDC way. Uh, and then we had some discussion around the differences between the various responses and explored the possible reasons for this. And following that, we came up with some action points for further improving the partnership. But the important part of it is really the end part. And it's the recommendations and actions created based on the feedback that can further strengthen the partnership. And I think this was the really vital part of it for us. And we've actually created an action plan which we've implemented between ourselves and Nigeria CDC to try and actually uh, take what we've learned from the tool forward and build upon it. And you'll see some of that in the next slide. So this is a table lifted from the um, publication itself. I recommend having a look at this in more detail if you're keen to learn about what practically changed based on the delivery of the tool. As you can see, there were some recommendations generated around dissemination and feedback, around leadership, around knowledge management. But I'll skip over these in, in the interest of time. Next slide, please. And these are some of the figures that we generated, again, demonstrating um, whether PHE and Nigeria CDC views on strength of the partnership matched. And as you can see, uh, PhD colleagues scored um, the various different modules of the Estra Effect tool slightly lower than Nigeria CDC colleagues um, did score. And again, the, the results section in, in the paper will go through some of this. Next slide, please. But this is really where I want to focus on because I think the important part of, of this session is really to understand what the benefits of delivering the tool was and what were the challenges with the evaluation process. So there are some really important benefits that we gained from this. It demonstrates what the partnership, partnership perceptions across the organizations were. It's a baseline measurement of that partnership strength because we delivered it so early on within the partnership. And we intend to follow up delivery of this tool to monitor how things have changed over time and whether the partnership strengthened over time uh, or how the partnership has matured over time. This also is evidence for our funders to demonstrate areas of strength and skills gained through the partnership. So also from a funding perspective and from a monitoring and evaluation perspective, it's been very helpful. There's also been clear identification of opportunities for improvement as shown through the action plan. And really, the, a really important part of this, which um, it just came as a byproduct, but actually became quite important, was the facilitation of the open and transparent conversation between the leadership teams, between the two partners. And that's really improved the overall relationship. So not only did we get baseline measurement of exactly how strong the partnership is, but through delivery of the tool, we were able to foster that open and transparent culture. But as with anything, there are a few challenges. And ensuring that there was a reasonable quantity of participants, including throughout the hierarchy of both organizations was, was a challenge. And reflecting on that, I would want to make sure that we had people at all sort of managerial levels in, involved within uh, administration of the tool. And as you can see, there was variation of responses between the different management levels and different parts of the organizations. There were also variations in how the questions were interpreted. So perhaps that's a learning point for us in introducing the tool itself and being clearer on the aims and objectives. And uh, like I say, the tool was administered early in the partnership's formation, so it may not be reflective of the mature relationship that we have now a couple of years down the line. Next slide, please. 
So I came up with a list of a few recommendations from my perspective on what future Esther Effect tool delivery could look like. My, my first plea to everyone is, is do try it out. International, institutional health partnerships are a vital part of improving global health security, and we're not good at measuring them. Um, too often, we do have this patriarchal way of engaging with partners, especially um, given what traditionally has been called north-south engagement between partners, and we ignore aspects such as bi-directional learning, which actually are captured very well within the ESSER effect tool. There's a link there about power asymmetries in global health, and uh, I think that can be posted in the chat. Uh, and I would encourage everyone to really le read about that because it really brings to the fore um, how we may misunderstand what institutional health partnerships look like and are perceived by partners uh, and the power asymmetries and the power dynamics between them. Fixing those can really help global health move forward and become more of a, a equitable, inclusive uh, way of ensuring global health security. My second recommendation is really put in the time to prep properly. We have to make sure if you're delivering the tool to get the right level of partners engaged with this and to help them understand why the tool is being delivered. And I think building the evidence such as through this publication that we've produced will hopefully help with that and help our partners understand, okay, this is why we actually want to explore the strength of our institutional health partnership. My third recommendation is commit resource to follow up. There's no point in delivering the tool and then doing nothing with it. What you really want to do is use the tool as a springboard for further changes and further maturation of the institutional health partnership. And fourth, and also very, very important, be mindful of the context, because open and transparent communication uh, will also be dependent on the ways of working in our partner countries and adapting and recognizing the different ways of working in the different cultures and contexts that we live in and adapting the delivery of the tool to your context is vital. Um, and as part of that, I, I would reflect that um, we have recently also uh, delivered the tool virtually in Ethiopia with our colleagues in, in EPHI, the Ethiopian Public Health Institute. And we've had to do that remotely, uh, which presented its own challenges um, and I would, my reflection would be it's much better to actually get people uh, sitting around the table. And uh, next slide, please. And that's all from me for today. Uh, if you're interested in reading the publication, please uh, look at the link in the, in the chat. Uh, if you're interested in engaging with our project, there's a link there for our recently launched online knowledge hub. You can learn more about the Esther Effect tool and how we delivered it and more about our project as well. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Dirty. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for this practical um, presentation about your experience. Thank you. Um, I would like to hand over to David Wigliam, who um, will also talk about a practical experience with the effect tool um, in a partnership between uh, the Esther um, Island partnership with Mozambique. David is um, the Global Health Program Director in the Health Service Executive in Ireland. And Please save it over to you. Uh, th thank you very much, Dorte, and good afternoon, everyone. I I'm quite pleased actually to be going third of the, among the speakers. Uh, when Emma was speaking at the beginning, it reminded me a lot of the process that we went through working with Emma and, and with, sorry, with Vicky, sorry, I meant Vicky, with Vicky and Emma in the development of the tool. And I very much echo the various things that she said about it. And I liked Achmed's presentation of presenting a really kind of in-depth look at how the tool was used in practice. And it just really, for me, confirms the value of the tool that is really very useful to, to, when it's applied in that comprehensive way. The example I'm sharing, I think maybe is, it's fair to say, is maybe a little bit of a less successful use of the tool, but was quite useful. It was useful in, in teaching us some things, but also it maybe has given some reflections on the tool and how we might use it in different, in different situations where perhaps we're not always in a position to have such, do a comprehensive review of the way the partnership is working. So I'll just briefly say a few things about the partnership. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the partnership between our health service in Ireland, the health service executive and the Ministry of Health in Mozambique. It's one of a number of partnerships we have from the health service. And my interest in evaluation is not while I focus on this partnership, it's thinking more broadly about different partnerships that we're involved in and how to strengthen them. 
So the partnership began in, in 2014. The president from Mozambique came in a state visit to Ireland and we were invited to consider starting a collaboration in the area of health service improvement. And we signed an agreement with the Ministry of Health. And we really didn't know what we were going to do with them at the time. So there followed a period of relationship building, getting to know each other, exchange visits both ways. And that really took over, it was a two year process where we were identifying who were the key leaders on to work with. And what emerged then was a clear area of collaboration that led to a shared vision around improving quality of care. The diagram I put here is really just to show that it's while the key players or partners were the HSC and the Ministry of Health, there were other parties involved too in the partnership. So a lot of relationships were built up over this period. The person in the middle here, Ella, Dr. Eleni Amado is the key focal point for us, such a person we worked with. She was the, in charge of the hospitals in Mozambique and we worked very closely with her. The technical work only started in 2017, that we were ready to start that work. It involved quality improvement with hospitals and building capacity in the area of quality and safety with the Ministry of Health. It involved numerous workshops. It involved supervision between the workshops by the Ministry of Health overseeing the hospitals. It involved hospital visits when we visited from Ireland, which was maybe once or twice a year. And it involved distance learning or distance edge through webinars, coaching webinars. And the hospitals from the start, they implemented quality improvement projects, which was addressing issues of poor quality in their hospital and also a learning for them on the methods of quality improvement. 15 hospitals were engaged in this process. 2020, like this time last year, February last year, just before the pandemic started, we had a chance to go and visit and we were asking questions about how things were, were going and whether we had achieved good results. And we, we visited some hospitals to get a snapshot. One example here, a hospital where they had a big problem a few years ago with high maternal, high inpatient mortality, 24 hour mortality. They reduced it from 11 per month to four per month back in 2017. And when we visited, we found they had continued that, that improvement. And by 2019, it was reduced from 58 deaths two years before to eight deaths. So they were improving and that was being sustained. We had not visited in a year, so this was really down to their own efforts. Another hospital where their project focused on reducing waiting times for gynecology outpatients. And they had back in 2017 achieved their, their target of reducing to 30 days. When we visited last year, they said they'd reduced to 20 days. In fact, they'd reduced it to seven days, 20 days for the second visit. And this was again being sustained and the approach was being applied in other wards. So we are into an evaluation. Is, our, is the work we're doing good and effective? But why, why do we need a partnership evaluation tool? And for me, it's about really understanding how working as a formal partnership has contributed to the results achieved. And Vicky has spoken about that. What is it about the partnership that has made the difference, working in partnership? And then how can we learn from that to improve the work we're doing through the partnership? And then there's the more broader question, which again, Vicky talked about, is how do we learn more generally about the, the partnership approach as a way of, of technical collaboration? Is this an effective way? And as Vicky spoke about earlier, the partnership is, is, is goes beyond the project. We can, we can implement projects, but the value of the partnership is the long-term relationship that allows us to be involved in embedding lasting sustainable change. So we needed something to complement existing M&E tools and Vicky spoke about that. So I, I don't need to, I won't say much, say more than that, but that, but the, the effect tool is, is really the, the response to that recognizing that we needed something more. We absolutely need the M&E tools, but we need something more as well. So how did we use it? In September, 2018, we were doing an evaluation of our overall collaboration. And we decided to use the effect tool for that part of the evaluation, which focused on looking at evaluating the partnership and how the partnership itself was working. So we completed the, the tool on, on our side and then in a visit to Mozambique, we had a meeting with uh, the person I showed you earlier, Dr. Elenia, to go through the tool together. It was not possible to have a group involved. 
we met in her office. It was very busy. It was quite challenging to find the time to do it. So we, we did it together in a meeting. And as we went through it, the person who was with me asked us questions. I went through the, the questions with her and we documented it. And uh, at times we needed to also to explain what the questions were, 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 were asking. Uh, English is not her first language. So that was, well, was, was a challenge. And then we analyzed the results later. And like the Ahmed showed, we were able to produce results showing uh, what our assessment on both sides against the different parameters. Comparing our scores, we were able to see where there were differences. And it was quite useful being in the room talking about through the different questions, what they were asking and to hear their perspective and how it sometimes differed from our perspective. So what do we do with the results? Certainly at the end of it, I felt I had a better understanding of how our partners view the collaboration. And that was very, very good to, to really to, to validate, I suppose, that, that the partnership was working well, but also to, to see where they see the, saw the strengths and areas to improve. Whether it made a big difference to the way our partnership works, I'm not sure. I think maybe we already had a lot of strengths in our partnership, and maybe this wasn't the best example for maybe to where we needed to be learning around particular areas. I don't know if we're making a lot of doing things differently as a result. It certainly gave insights, better insights into how the partnership was working. And it also encouraged me to replicate the approach with other partnerships because it, I think for me, validated the way we were working. I think we had, we had a good approach and I think that was, re was reflected in the results from the, the effect tool. And I think this, this is a slide from Elenia when she came to, to Dublin for it and gave a presentation. And her last slide is about partnership. And she said, but one swallow does not make a summer. And this means it'd be very difficult for you to move through parts of the scenario alone. Together, we go further. And perhaps what this kind of I showed was that she was very committed and they were very committed to partnership working together with us as we were with them. And already, I think we had a strong partnership and, and so I think the, the assessment didn't identify weaknesses, a lot of weaknesses in the way we were working together. I think we had a, we had a strong relationship. So what did we learn or maybe what did I learn from using the effect tool? I think it's a really useful tool. I really like it. I think it, it, it can give great insights into how the partnership is working. It, it's best as a self-assessment tool. I don't think so useful as an objective assessment. There's a question of whether there's, there can be biases when you're discussing something together between partners, but you're always getting a, 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 an accurate view of, of, of everything. And the new insights were, were very helpful and confirmed a strong partnership approach. Language was a challenge, and that's one of the points of feedback from our experience was that where it's not an English speaking country, how to make the tool accessible. The other issue is about the motivation for using the tool. It was our idea. It was part of the evaluation that we were doing with them. But I had the sense that, that while I was approaching it as a joint exercise, they were seeing it more as our exercise. And I'm not sure, and that was a learning for me. I felt there wasn't any quality even in using the tool because it was our idea. And we were, we were doing it in, in, a, in a busy setting in an office that where I felt maybe necessary that they didn't necessarily see that they needed to be doing it, whereas we, we wanted to do it. So that was just one of, one of my observations. So finally, the rec recommendations. I think the tool is very comprehensive. And I think hearing Ahmed's presentation has confirmed for me that as it is, it's a really good tool. But we may also need something simpler as well where we have partnerships where we don't get the opportunity to sit together for a significant period and discuss two things in detail. We might go to Mozambique for a week, but in that week, we might only get half an hour with our, our key counterparts in the Ministry of Health. So how can we use very short amounts of time to really have a good discussion and review assessment of the partnership? I wonder if it's a tool most useful if the partnership is weak and, and faces challenges. I think I could see how in other partnerships that are not as strong, how the tool could be really helpful in, in explore, understanding and exploring weaknesses in the partnership and how it can be strengthened. And I think I'd emphasize the value for self-assessment and as it's a self-assessment tool is where it's most useful involving both partners in the collaboration. Thank you.
Great, thank you so much, David. Thank you to all three presenters. Thank you very much for these insights. So um, the floor is now open for um, discussion. And um, so please feel free to, to post your questions in the Q&A &Q um, chat box. Um, Hala, I don't know, they, can they speak or? <laughs> If anyone wants to speak, they can raise their hand and then we can allow them to turn on their videos. Okay, excellent. So, so far, I don't see any questions yet. Maybe um, to, as, as a start, um, so David, you, you, you said that um, sometimes it may not be possible to have um, that much time. So I was wondering, how much time should it take actually? Uh, maybe um, both um, Ahmed and, and David, and maybe also Vicky, what, do, what do, did you have in, in mind? How much time should be invested um, in using the effect tool? David, do you um, want to start? Uh, yeah, um, would you want me to go first? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's great if you have more time, I think, because I think, uh, a lot of times you can work a lot with people, but not actually discuss how you're working together as partners. And I think to have a space to do that is really valuable. It's, so it's really the question of what's practical. If you have the time, I think it would be good to spend an hour or two reviewing the partnership, especially when there's substantial work being done together. At the same time, I think when, and the example of our experience is when it's difficult to find that time, that dedicated time is to have something as well to be able maybe to have something of a more focused discussion that might help zone in on maybe a couple of the key issues around the partnership that where maybe there are issues and where it could be strengthened. Ahmed, um, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Um, actually, David's presentation made me reflect on, on, on what actually made the delivery of our tool successful and, and how that contrasted with David's experience. And I think some of it is to do with the partnership working model that we have. Uh, so for our project, we have embedded country leads within the partner National Public Health Institute. So we have someone who's constantly sitting there um, within Nigeria's CDC and has all of these personal relationships. Uh, and then uh, as a result, perhaps can get a bit more buy in to, to the application of the tool, can get the senior level stakeholders around the table. Uh, and it's not a case of us sort of uh, flying in for a week and then having to deliver the tool because a lot of the people that are going to be around that table are already in country. And that, because they have the, that level of sort of personal relationship, uh, and also that they're embedded within the country, and then also because we work across a right, wide range of uh, domains of activity. So, for example, in Nigeria, we work across surveillance, labs, uh, chemicals, hazards, um, uh, emergency response, One Health. So there's a wide range of things that we do, and that allows for a number of different people across the board to be part of this, uh, and having that sort of maybe uh, deeper and in-country uh, level of partnership may assist in how the tool is, is, is uh, delivered. Uh, that's just my reflection on, on David's presentation. Maybe I can just say something. I think. Yeah, Vicky, go ahead. Yeah, when, when we developed it, I, um, yeah, we always saw it as being something which could be used flexibly. And I think, yeah, when we, we did some pilot testing and we just, we just worked with the sort of the lead from the northern partner and the lead from the southern partner so it was just one person from each side and it was like the person who was most knowledgeable about the sort of all aspects of the program from its design to its implementation and yeah the time it took to bury I, I, I think the model that Ahmed used where there was then a structured workshop where people did it independently then they came together I think was quite powerful um, and and I, th I think again, as Ahmed so so eloquently said, it, it, it's it's actually you know what you do with that data afterwards is that transparency, the discussion, and coming up with action plans. I remember when we were piloting it, we yeah we the, one of the partnerships was a really long established partnership for more than ten years. But I remember the UK partner lead said, you know, we assume that, you know, I haven't been out there for a year. So we kind of assume certain things are happening. And actually, she, she said she found it quite illuminating when they both completed it. And, and actually, there were some things where there were quite big misunderstandings, um, even though they were a long established 
partnership with, with good relationships, but that so independently doing it, but then because they had a good partnership, they could discuss freely about it. She, she said she found that very valuable. Yeah. Uh, Emma, I don't know if you want to add anything or... Yeah, I think one of the other, I mean, as Vicky said, I mean, we always wanted it to be to be flexible, to be used differently by different partnerships, because there's such a range of partnerships in, in the sense of the amount of resources that go into them apart from anything else. And, and one of the flexibilities is that it it is designed to be modular. Um, and, and so I think, you know, coming back to what David was saying, you, you know, maybe where you have less time it's about thinking about which of those modules actually seems to be where it would be most fruitful to have those discussions um, and not feeling that you have to necessarily use use the whole tool so so i think there is there is scope to kind of adapt it to to your particular purpose but also to your particular resourcing as well um, but I, I think you know that that really important um part of it it's not so much how long it takes to fill in and and then complete the diagrams it's the time that you have to discuss the results and, and that's the crucial bit and obviously that does take time um, to do and, and coming up with those improvements thank you very much so yeah so it's quite clear that the discussion is really the the most important aspect of doing this effect tour of completing this tool um, there's one question in the chat box um, from Stefan Bodis from Zurich. How do you integrate government institutions for mutual benefit? How much independence is needed from government institutions for an optimal partnership? Who wants to take on this question first? <laughs> I would like to hear a little bit more if, if you would like to speak to explain the issue a little bit more. Hello, can you give him the floor? Sure. To Stefan sure. Bodis, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, John, can you can you promote him to panelists, please? Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Stephen Bodis. Sorry to put him on the spot. I hope he doesn't mind. He raised his hand, so good. Just happy to. We have him here now. Okay. You're still muted. Do you have to unmute him or? I think you should be able, Stephen. Yes. I can try again. Do you hear yes, me? Yes, we Perfect. hear you. Thank you very much, Dory, and thank you for your patience. Um, it's a small question, but um, you know, I had some limited experience with um, some short-term programs in Ghana and in Ethiopia. And for us, for myself, it was all, also very difficult to find a good balance between focusing on the project, some independency from the project, from governmental um, institutions, from governmental influence, from uh, governmental interests, but also to have them on board for a constructive midterm, long-term partnership. And I'm very interested to learn from your experiences because I think to start a new partnership, this is a crucial point. Thank you very much. Who wants to go? I'll, I'll answer first if, if um, that's okay. Just some reflections really. I don't really have an answer for you, unfortunately, Stephen, but some reflections on from our project's point of view. I think global health is in inherently political and we're often beholden to our, our political masters in, in a lot of this. Um, some examples from the project ourselves, we, we, we have worked in the past with Sierra Leone and currently, uh, although it's on pause at the moment because of the political situation there with Myanmar as well. Um, so we, we try and work with partners on the basis of partner National Public Health Institute to National Public Health Institute. And uh, obviously the idea is that we're working specifically on health and health security uh, and that hopefully that is all technical advice. It isn't uh, at all supposed to be political by any means. It's all about global health security. It's not about um, trying to interfere in politics or trying to change anything like that. But we do have to understand uh, the context that we work in and be aware of the political situations that we work in. 
as, a, as an example, um, in Sierra Leone, we worked closely with the Ministry of Health there. When COVID-19 uh, unfortunately hit, um, the, the management of the COVID response was handed over to the military in Sierra Leone, which meant that a lot of the partners that we were working with within the Ministry of Health uh, weren't able to influence policy decisions in the same way, which of course adversely affected our partnership. I think the main thing that I've taken from that is that we have to be cognizant and aware of the political situations in each of these countries, try and emphasize that we are technical uh, and we are trying to do technical collaborations rather than anything else. We're not trying to be political and then try and work within those paradigms um, as best as we can. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the, the ability to get in, involved and we shouldn't get involved uh, in, in the political machinations in country because that would adversely affect um, the role that we play as technical collaborators. Thank you. Excellent. Can I come in there, Dr? Please do. I think that's a really good question. Now, the partnership I, I spoke about is actually working with governments, so that's a slightly different case. But many of our partnerships are with institutions that are not, or are, are in maybe away from from different parts of countries. Not that they might be remote, but they're not working with. Um, they may be work with with non-governmental services, or they have some separation maybe from government. I think the for me. It's very, very important to be aligned with government policies and structures for long-term change. And, some, and sometimes we go into there are situations where they don't work well, but if we want to achieve lasting benefit, I don't think we can achieve that without working with government institutions. And the long-term goal, I think, is we want strong government bodies that are able to support the work of local health institutions. So I think we may focus a lot on short, on if we're running projects, we can implement a project in the short term, but for sustainable change, I think relationships with government both locally and nationally really will help to, I think, to sustain any changes that we can bring about. So I would take the view that it's good to build relationships with government, it can be very challenging, but I think for, for long-term benefit, it's worth investing in finding good ways to work together. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Maybe just to add one other point in the ESTA tool, it talks, you know, at, in the first module, um, it asks you to assess the harmonization and alignment. Because I think, as David, David says, it's really important that whatever you're doing is aligned with government policy, but also harmonized with any other initiatives which are in the region. I remember once when we were evaluating a health partnership program, an example where there was no harmonization and the partnership project was actually doing something counter to what the government was planning to do. And I think that is where you could potentially say it could be doing harm. So I think it's really important of in, in ensuring that stakeholders are involved, all government stakeholders and other partners are aware of what you're doing. Um, and the, the tool allows you to, you know, you, you can assess that throughout the program by getting both both sides of the partnership to measure or rate themselves in terms of harmonization and alignment. So really important. Thank you very much all. Thank you, thank you all. I see one question in the chat box, which probably goes beyond the, the scope of, of this webinar asking about um, the investment for health system strengthening. Um, I, I don't know if anybody wants to respond. I, I, I'm under the impression that that goes beyond the, the focus of, um, and probably is a question to all partnerships. Um, but if anybody wants to, to respond to that. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to chip in because it, I think that, I mean, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shown us once again, the fragility and weakness of health systems everywhere. And the need to, you know, to continue to focus on, on strengthening systems. And I think that institutional partnerships can contribute to that. And while many of institutional partnerships aren't working at the national level, a strong health system is made up of strong institutions. There are many different health institutions in any country that are, that are part of the makeup of that health system. And so, so I think I would see the, we're, being, we're reminded at this time of the need for building up these institutions. And we can do that through the institutional health partnership approach. And that can have an impact at the local level where that an institution can be strengthened through a north-south partnership. But also if that low institution has links to the national level, it can perhaps improve practice more widely by you know, developing better ways of working or by influencing 
policies and strategies. So I think that is a relevant question, uh, both in for institutional partnerships, but also a timely one with the pandemic and the reminder that if we don't, in, you know, if there isn't investment in health system strengthening, we'll see further challenges in years to come in, in uh, low income countries. Emma? Thank you. Um, just to say, I mean, this is a, an area where for some of the other evaluations we've been doing recently, we've been reflecting on, on institutional strengthening. And I think that um, one of the things that, that we need to reflect on is that institutional strengthening requires investment and system strengthening requires investment. Um, you can't have a project and then just expect the system to strengthen on the back of having a project. You need to invest in actually strengthening systems, whether that's at the institutional level or it's at a wider health systems level. And I do think that, you know, the more we can try and get this message over, you know, uh, to funders that actually there is a lot of investment that is required. We've got a lot of systems that have been under invested in throughout their existence. Um, and so actually, you know, this isn't something that requires a sticking plaster, it needs serious investment. So I do think that this is a really, really important issue. Um, and it, it's one that we should all, you know, try and, and um, not speak to the converted, but speak to the unconverted <laughs> and convert them as well. Thank you very much, Emma. Anybody else? Um, how can we engage the private sector also without advancing private health for people with mo more assets? <laughs> I think they're all, all excellent questions, maybe going way beyond the effect tool. <laughs> um, do you want to raise your hand and so you can you can speak maybe? I don't I unfortunately can't see the name. Um, I think it's Bree Jagan. How can we engage the private sector also without advancing private health for people with more assets? <laughs> I, I would say that this question, it, it's, an, it's a very important question. Um, I would still say it goes beyond um, the, the focus of, of this webinar. So, um, oh, there, there is, there you are. Did, did you wanna? Oh, sorry, I thought I was on mute. Um, yes. Yeah, following on what David is saying, I mean, particularly as we're still living through a pandemic that is demonstrating the weaknesses of health systems and lack of investment from A to Z, Afghanistan to Zambia, Ireland to Israel to the USA, you know, there is no development, children are out of school. It's taking me back to the worst days of AIDS when there was no treatment from middle class to richer to poorer people. Livelihoods collapsed, you know, there, there is no development or, or livelihood improvement without investment in health and health systems. I've, I've been working on a paper all morning on health systems and I don't know what we can do if we can convince leaders and the private sector. I mean, production is affected. Supply chains are affected. Transport is affected. Holidays for rich people who can afford it is affected. If we can convince people to invest more in this current period, I feel we'll have missed a huge opportunity. Be Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for, yeah. uh, for this contribution. I think it's a very important point. Um, I, I appreciate your participation. I, I am afraid it goes beyond um, the focus of, of this webinar. So, um, and um, I also have to look at the time. Um, it's almost three o'clock. Thank you very much for your participation. Hala, can I hand over to you? Yes. So uh, I, I see now that we have to
attendees, they would like to ask questions. So you can stay for after this, but now I will wrap up this uh, part of the webinar. Um, so thank you to all our speakers for these important lessons and insights about evaluating health partnerships and also effect tool. We hope to see you again in one of our coming webinars. Uh, in order to improve our webinars, please uh, fill the evaluation form that we have sent in the chat box and uh, the recording of the webinar will be included in our YouTube channel and also our uh, website. And uh, also thank you for the attendees for interacting during the webinars and asking. And please also uh, stay tuned for our coming webinar. And uh, for now, we will stop the recording and maybe we can receive uh, other questions if people would like to ask uh, more practical questions about uh, effect tool. Yeah, this is really only um, very practical.